Today we're going to be looking at Sutta number one, the Mura Pariyaya Sutta. I usually leave that to the end, but next Saturday uh, the Singaporeans will be here for their retreat and I realize that I really should be Saturday evening over at Jana Grove giving a Q&A session to the Singaporean retreatants. So the next Saturday, the last of the Sutta class, which will be the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, we invited Ajahn Pramali to teach that. So I asked him which one did he prefer to do, and he said he prefers to do Satipatthana. So uh, I'll be just doing the Murapariyaya Sutta. Is enough there for everybody, these little... What about the ladies, you got one each? Everyone got one? Okay, very good. This is just an explanation. And, um, uh, sorry? <laughs> very good. Here we go. Uh, so this Mura Pariyaya Sutta, the root of all things, it is the very first sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, and that's not an accident. They tend to put some very powerful teachings at the very beginning, such as in the first sutta of the Deacon Nikaya, What's it called? Brahmajara Sutta. And that's just saying what right view or what wrong view is. So just getting right at the very beginning so for people understanding what is the right view according to Buddhism and what isn't. And so this one over here is also incredibly powerful teaching. But it stands out uh, above all the other teachings probably in the whole of the Tripitaka because in the end you actually see there that the last sentence, that is what the Blessed One said, but those bhikkhus did not delight in the Blessed One's <laughs> words, which is really strange. In other words, it just shows you that just sometimes, just because you're a Buddha, just people don't agree with you. That basically, they said they didn't understand what the Buddha was saying. And it was actually that deep, and even the time of the Buddha, the people just did not understand what on earth the Buddha was on about. And of course there's a happy ending, which I'll get to at the very end, that uh, he actually did eventually teach them. And again, these were teachings which were not meant to be some philosophy which would be there for all time. So they were teachings which were specially directed at the audience. So he was speaking to the people in front of him. So eventually, especially the commentary says, and it's quite likely this is true, they were very proud uh, people who were listening to him and one of the reasons the Buddha gave this teaching to put them in their place to show them just how little they understood and to give them something very deep to ponder and that became the Mura Pariyaya which as you expect the root of all things you know the essence of all things is a very powerful title so with that introduction I will now uh, do the Namotasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sankhang namasami so this is the first sutra of the Majjhima Nikaya, the Murapariyaya Sutta, the root of all things. Thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was living in Ukata, in the Subhaga Grove at the root of a royal sala tree. So this is not in the usual abodes in Rajagaha or Vesali or Sawati. And obviously by staying at the root of a sala tree, not in a monastery but out in the open. There he addressed the monks thus, monks, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this, Monks, I shall teach you a discourse on the root of all things. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the monks replied, and the Blessed One said this. Now I'm going to go through the whole thing, the ordinary person here. It may seem a bit... Um, a lot and a lot of repetition which is why that I've given you these sheets so if I refer to the sheet over here this is from Bhikkhu Bodhi's discourse on this sutta 
and you have here the individual, the uninstructed worldling and then the learner, the arahat and the buddha the uninstructed worldling is someone who has not reached the state of being a stream winner yet the learner is a stream winner, a once returner or a non-returner the arahat is completely uh, enlightened and there's a buddha, a special case so in one sense this shows you the difference between a buddha and an arahat and you can see in each of the uh, in this table over here you have the primary cognition just basically you perceive something you see, you experience something and then your initial response is you just perceive it as it is you think you really know what's going on and then you have a conceptual response you actually conceive X in X from X, X is mine what these actually are is the conceit in Buddhism is where you make a self that's a special type of conceit here so the conceptual response you think this is me or I'm somehow contained in this or this is actually uh, evolves from me like a shadow from a tree or this is mine, I, this is, uh, I possess this so you can see that this is where the sense of an outer self comes in and the emotive response is the ordinary unstructured worldling is you delight in it because you think it's yours or something to do with you because of this sense of self that somehow or other you're involved in, involved in this or you own it that is where the delight comes from if it's none of my business then no need for delight no need for delight, no need for anger, nothing it's not my problem and the reason is because you haven't fully understood this and for the learner, I'll just go over this and I'll come back to it at the very end for the learner, this is the stream winner, yeah they perceive just like everybody else but they directly know this in other words their view has been uh, straightened so because they know that this is just a phenomenon, it's not me, not mine, not a self, they know it but they have to be very careful therefore let them not think that this is them or think they're somehow involved in this or they, they're developed from this or this is theirs because for the stream winner, the ones who turn out heart, they can still lose it, they can still have those wrong thoughts even though their views are straight the thoughts are sometimes not in line so they can still, even though they know there's no self still they can still think that this is me because the views and the thoughts, the concepts are different and the emotive response, therefore they make sure they don't delight in these things in order that you might fully understand it and the arahat, yeah they perceive like anything else, but they directly know just like the stream winner but they don't conceive these things and in other words, all the time the arahat they realize that all of these things, it's not me, not mine, not a self so they don't delight in these things, it's not their business and the reason is because they fully understood and because they fully understood they're also devoid of greed, hate and delusion and the only difference with the Buddha, like the Arahat everything the same except because they have fully understood these things to the end they've also understood dependent origination which is an interesting addition there the most important thing is the Arahat fully understood these things enough to let go but the depth of understanding of the Buddha is just total to the end so that's the schematic one now we go into the first the ordinary person this is again the person is not even a stream winner yet here amongst an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in a dhamma who has no regard for true people against stream winners Aryans and is unskilled and undisciplined in a dhamma perceives earth as earth having perceived earth as earth he conceives himself as earth himself somehow containing earth, conceives himself apart from earth he conceives earth to be mine, he delights in earth why is that? because he has not fully understood it and the same with the other three of the four great elements he perceives water as water, conceives himself as water, conceives himself in water, conceives himself apart from water he conceives himself water to be mine, he delights in water, why is that? because he has not fully understood it I say he perceives fire as fire, he perceives fire as fire so he conceives himself as fire, conceives himself in fire, conceives himself apart from fire, he conceives fire to be mine 
He delights in fire. Why is that? Because he has not fully understood it, I say. He perceives air as air. Having perceived air as air, he conceives himself as air. He conceives himself in air. He conceives himself apart from air. He conceives air to be mind. He delights in air. Why is that? Because he has not fully understood it, I say. So these are the four great elements. So let's actually combine them. So let's say, instead of the four great elements, your body. So you perceive your body. Having perceived the body, you conceive yourself as your body, like the materialists. People think they are their brain, they are their body, which means when they die, they think they're being, their self is being destroyed. Or somehow that you are somehow inside this body somewhere, like some soul in the head or in the heart somewhere, somehow contained in your body, that that's you, that's your essence. Or you consider yourself apart from it, but somehow or another this body emanates from yourself, this great sense of self looking down, controlling the body, as if this body is a, uh, an emanation of you. It's not, you're not contained in it, but the body, as it were, is contained in you. And lastly, that you say this body is mine. Now instead of taking the four great elements, one by one, which for most people it doesn't really um, make much sense to us these days, but when you actually say that what these four elements are is a body, it's you know, your possessions, you know, your robes, your um, can of coffee in your room, whatever you sort of uh, think, that this can of coffee you see or it's not the, maybe the can of coffee, you see the, um, the packet of tea and you perceive the tea and you perceive this tea is mine and therefore you delight in it. Why is because you haven't fully understood <laughs> the nature of tea <laughs> or anything else? So these four elements is actually your body or things which you think you own, things which you actually see. Like as an abbot, I've got to be very careful. The monastery is like a, some combination of the four great elements. So I can conceive myself, now I perceive the monastery, and instead of actually just knowing it deeply, just take it for granted, it's monastery is monastery. And you conceive yourself as your monastery, this is Ajahn Brahm's monastery, I built it, this is me, this is an emanation of who I am. You know, this is how I express myself in the building of this monastery. Or you can see yourself like contained in it. You know, that I'm the abbot, I belong in this monastery. Or that this monastery somehow again emanates from me, that you know, it was conceived in my mind and now here it is. And lastly, that it's my monastery. It's not your monastery, Matt. It's mine, okay, so I'm the boss. <laughs> and why is that? And then I delight in it. <laughs> and why is that? Because I haven't fully understood it. That's the problem. So that gives you an understanding of what this is all talking about. So it's not just you know, air, fire, air, earth and water. It's just the, how they all come together in the things of life. Now, you have the different levels of beings. He perceives beings. These are Bhutas. And Bhutas literally means having become, having gone into existence, whatever these are. So the Bhutas here uh, include human beings really and lower beings and uh, up to animals, ghosts in this widest sense uh, but not up to the gods because the gods are something different as we come afterwards. These are the Devas. So all those level of beings just underneath the gods including the hell realm beings and stuff. So he, he perceives beings, humans, animals, the cat. Having perceived the cat as the cat, you conceive the cat or beings, especially if you're being born in those states, you think this is me. Or you can say to yourself you're contained in this being called a human. Or you're contained in the being being a woman. That somehow that you are in there or somehow this woman emanates from you. That, you know, that woman is in you, or you're in woman, or you say that femininity is mine, or masculinity is mine. That you know, belongs to me. And why? And then what happens? You delight in this. Why is that? Because you haven't fully understood it. So I say, you, there's no women in this monastery, there's no men in this monastery, there are no monks, 
There was no Chinese, there was no Australians, there's no sort of Germans. Because if you do that, then if you think that somehow that Germanic nature is contained inside of you, you delight in that. <laughs> and there's big problems. <laughs> and why is that? Because you haven't fully understood it. <laughs> So that's the beings. Now you have the other layers of beings, like the devas, the gods. Having perceived gods as gods, you conceive that somehow that you know that you are a god, maybe like a god just being born in this human body, or you conceive yourself to be somehow you know in the godhead, or that you know this whole idea of gods emanates from your your um, ultimate sense of self. Well, the cosmic consciousness somehow comes down and gets uh, gets expressed in the existence of a god, or you think that you know this idea of being a god is yours, it's your possession. You finally manage to get that attainment that you're a deva and that's yours now. I've got it. You know, I'm a PhD. I'm a god. I'm an abbot. That's mine, and you guys can't take it over. Why is that? Because you haven't fully understood it. So I'll go through this and then for the questions. Uh, for the states of beings, now we can have some questions. You can see Pajapati is Pajapati. Now here we go to all these different layers of beings. And you see that some of these, they don't really fit in the normal um, 31 planes of existence. But the reason is because the 31 planes of existence are just one way of looking at all the way, different layers of beings. And there's many different ways, and 31 states of existence may have been there in the time of the Buddha, but because it's the nature of the mind to create, and we could have created more heavenly realms, other realms could have actually disappeared. The heaven of the 33 gods, that's in a particular one where they say that these beings of 33 were friends, who perform lots of good works and as a result of their good works they were reborn in the heaven of the 33. That's why it's called the heaven of the 33. But like all beings, one day they'll all pass away and so there won't be any 33. Probably they won't all pass away at the same time. So there may be the heaven of the 32, the 31, the 30. Just like you know, the 10 green bottles on a wall. One green bottle accidentally fell and then there's nine green bottles. So just like you know, that old nursery rhyme. In the same way that there'll be less there, and sometimes there'll be none, none left there, or maybe some other ones go up there and they join and be 34 or whatever. So, all of these different realms of existence, you know, they are a reasonable uh, description of the heaven realms, but especially, not the jhana realms, because they're pretty fixed, but all these other realms, the different ways of finding happiness in those deva realms are sometimes endless which is why they have another deva realm, which is not mentioned here, but other places, the, the kidda deva, the devas who just delight in play. Just the playful devas. And it's somehow they're not involved in here. But this is pajapati. Pajapati like a, like a lord. And because it's just under Brahma here, that some people think that that might be a synonym like for the Mara realm. There's the lower devas, they delight in sensory pleasures. You know, the Tusa devas, they're content. The, the Tawatingsa devas, they're, they're very sensual. Because in that Tawatingsa heaven, this is the heaven of the 33, they describe Saka's palace. That's in his, I think the Sangyutanikaya. With his palace with you know, a thousand towers, and every tower is a thousand rooms, and every room has a hundred nymphs. And some stupid Westerner worked out, and they wrote the book about how many actually nymphs were actually this Saka had? You know, how many concubines? My goodness, I mean, that was, you know, <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. But obviously, it was the sensory pleasure realm. And above that, you've got the Tusta realm. They're just, Tusta means they're at content. So their pleasure is just being content, not into sex, but just having this beautiful aesthetic sense of contentment, just probably just watching the equivalent of sunsets and just beautiful babbling streams and just the highest sensuality instead of just, you know, just low down sex and then above that you get the, the realms people get into creating you know, it is the aesthetes you know, who are, who are not actually 
into sensory pleasure or contemporary, we actually create things like the artists and the musicians, the people who can actually create these great works of art. And that is a higher pleasure. If ever you created anything, you know, that actually is a higher and more profound pleasure than so sex or even just you know, enjoying the beauty of nature, and making something. And above that is actually the ones who delight in the other's creations. The people who just go and watch you know, Beethoven's music <laughs> and just really get off on it, you know, instead of Beethoven himself. And that's just the ones who uh, delight in the other people's creations. And then above that is the power, you know, the maras. Now the ones who delight in power. And that's sort of the reason why that sometimes you read the newspaper and you wonder is why would anybody ever want to get into politics? Because they get just crucified, you know, by the newspapers. You know, they get sort of ridiculed and they get caricatured in the in the comics as being ugly, ridiculous and stupid. And who would actually want to put themselves through that? You know, what's the payoff? And the payoff is the, the delight in power, which is a higher pleasure of controlling others. And that's Mara. So that's actually the, the Pajapati, I would say those are the control freaks. So those people who get bored in there, they think that, you know, when they become like a control thing, they say, this is me. You know, I'm so great, so wise, so powerful, I can tell anybody what to do. Or you can see that's what the power is sometimes you know, within you, contained in your essence. That's your, your role in life to control your destiny you know, for the sake of other beings. You know, they're not as smart and as wise as you, so it's your destiny out of compassion to tell everybody what to do. Or that somehow or other that you know, yourself from the sense of this ultimate being, who you think you are, that sort of emanates this power. It's part of you know, your essential nature to be powerful and control. Or you think that power is mine. And that's why it's so hard for prime ministers and presidents to give up power. You know, even though that sometimes they, they do really good jobs when they first get into positions of office. And over the years, you know, when they're way past their use by, a, by date, they just can't let it go. Why? Because it's mine. And they delight in that. Why is it? Because they haven't fully understood it, I say. Brahma! Having perceived Brahma's Brahma, you know exactly what a Brahma is. This beautiful uh, bliss, sometimes like Brahma Vihara, it's like love. Have understood love. You perceive love as love. And you conceive that I am the ultimate love. You know, I have united with love. I am, just not the God of power, but the God of peace and love for all beings. Well, because somehow, you, even higher than that, you see that this love is within something bigger. You know, which is more sort of cosmic, you know, the universe, and sometimes love is inside of it. Or somehow that love contains all and you're inside of that. Or that this Brahma, this ultimate love, that's mine. And you delight in that experience of being the essence of pure love. And why is that? Because you don't understand love. That, I'm talking about the small stuff, I'm talking about the big, the cosmic love. If you ever had those experiences, sometimes, it's, I find it interesting, some of the lay people who haven't had any idea of Buddhism, and they do experience a jhana, and they come out afterwards and they try and explain it. It's incredible power, this pure love, bliss. Or they have these near-death experiences, they go into these nimittas. And they sort of, you know, afterwards, what was it like in that realm? Like just the most peaceful, just pure love, everything. Because their idea of love is the only word they can use to describe, you know, the bliss, the sense of selflessness, the, the power, you know, of the jhana. So that's why I've used in the Brahma Viharas and the idea of like the first jhana. Or you perceive now we really get into the nice stuff, the gods of streaming radiance. There's the gods of streaming radiance. Now that's the highest of the second jhana realms. Having perceived 
the jhana as second jhana. You conceive yourself as as a second jhana. Now, I should have mentioned with the Brahma that sometimes when people do get into jhanas, and they do say get into first jhana, such a powerful experience, they think this is it, they're enlightened, they're one with all. This is the essential being who they are. And that's one of the problems, so that's where because you don't go further, that's where you think, that's it, I'm aligned, I've finished the end of it. And you can understand how that happens. Powerful bliss, you know, the most purest experience you have, this is the real me, at last. I've come to my true self. It's powerful. And then you get streaming radiance. Wow, okay, Robert wasn't the real me, but the streaming radiance, that really is it. <laughs> that's so much bigger. And you people who think you're God, and you're union with God, I mean, you don't know anything to streaming radiance. <laughs> and this, streaming radiance, don't think streaming radiance is, is where things are radiating out, that's just the name they give it. It's not descriptive, it's just they haven't got anything else to call it. And, you haven't got to the second jhana, or the, no, the second jhana realm, you conceive yourself as that, this is the real me. Or you could be a bit more profound, that no, no, you're bigger than that. But this is containing, this is how, how you're being expressed right now. This essential me is being expressed in its purest form of the second jhana. Or that somehow that you know, your essence is somehow contained in this experience. Like a nut in its shell. Or lastly, this is mine. I own this, which means I will not let it go. And because of that, you delight in that state. Or, the gods of refulgent glory. This is third jhana realms. The same thing, you perceive you know, that state, at last this is a real me. All these other things, I thought they were, but now I've got to this state. I mean, this is obviously, the other ones weren't, but this one must be me. So you can see this is your essence, you can see this all somehow contained in this, or, or that uh, you contain this state, or you think that this state is yours. And because of that you do light in those states, because you have not fully understood it. And the last, the gods of great fruits, this is the fourth jhana realm. So you experience this state, you know that this is a state which, you know, when you die, you can actually remain in after death as actually a state of existence. And having perceived these things, you take them on face value, you don't see them deeper. So you can see if the, you know, these, this is the real you, or that somehow that you're contained in this, or this is contained in the real you. You can see these as yours, your possession, your attainment. This is what you've achieved now. Because when you become, say, a PhD, you get that attainment at university, you call yourself a doctor. It's my attainment. And now I'm going to be a doctor for the rest of my life. And why are you delight in that? I'm a doctor. And why is this? Because you haven't fully understood it. Now you get something even more. The overlord whatever that is, and that's the only time it's actually mentioned in the suttas. What the Buddha is actually saying is, these are all words like they have in our uh, modern vocabulary, you know, you may say Jehovah, you may say God, Allah, you may say Krishna or whatever, all the different names which people have for some ultimate being, and people continue to make new words for the ultimate being. So anyway, they say, you perceive the overlord as the overlord. And again, it doesn't fit into any particular uh, spot in the 31 planes of existence. And they put it here between the, the jhana realms and the arupa realms. It's really weird, but no, I don't know why. So the overlord is the overlord. Having perceived the overlord as the overlord, you conceive the overlord, you conceive yourself in the overlord, conceive the overlord to be in you, conceive the overlord to be mine. In other words, that state. You're you know, way above everything. Now you get the Arupa states. You perceive the base of infinite space. Basically you have that attainment in jhanas. And you having perceived that you take it on face value, you 
perceived the base of infinite space as a base of infinite space, having perceived that base of infinite space as a base of infinite space, you conceive that that's you. That concept, that idea comes up, that is the essence of me. Or you conceive yourself that, you know, somehow that you are bigger and you are actually can hold this, or you are sometimes in the essence of infinite space. Or you take that attainment to be your inalienable possession. And therefore you delight in that attainment, because you haven't fully understood it. The same with the other arupas, the infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, and lastly the base of neither perception nor non-perception. I'm running through these now. And you perceive these as they are, and that's very interesting now, the bit of oxymoron, you perceive neither perception nor non-perception. Get your head around that if you can. <laughs> You're perceiving this, but there's no perception there. Or is there perception? So anyway, <laughs> you perceive neither perception nor non-perception, have perceived the base of neither perception nor non-perception, you conceive yourself, this at last is the real essence, or this, somehow I'm inside of this, or sometimes this is inside of me. And this is the, the highest way I can know myself. Or you conceive this to be your attainment. Because of that you delight in it. Why is that? Because you haven't fully understood it. So those are uh, the states of being. And of course those higher states of being also um, correlate with the, the jhana realms and the arupa realms. So there I'm going to pause for a bit and there we come into the, the sensed. In other words what you experience. So, questions? You had a question? Um, like when you see in the mind, a normal person sees in their mind that they're delighting and conceiving, um, and you see it as a blemish, but should you be compassionate to that and just say it's just part of the condition? Okay, it's uh, at the, when one's meditating, one is delighting, and one is, what's the other one? One is. We just say in ordinary objects. Yeah, ordinary objects, yeah. yeah. Okay, at first it's just too complicated because sometimes one would be delighting in something and say, no, I'm not going to delight in it. And then you delight in the non delighting. I'm meditating at last. How good I am. It just gets so complex. So that's why I don't like doing vipassana until after samatha. Because sometimes it's just too complex. So keep it simple. Just basically let go, don't delight in anything, just be content, be peaceful, shut up and just don't think too much. Mm. And when you're very, very peaceful and calm, you get as deep as you can, these things especially are warning you, when you do get into these, especially the jhanas, this isn't the end, this isn't reaching the goal, this isn't who you really are, this isn't the ultimate, you know, uh, original mind essence of you, the ground of all being, now I've realized my essential self, this is the real being, the real Godhead, the real cosmic consciousness, I'm one with this, all those sorts of things, you know, union with God. You know, that's, you know, in Christianity, as I said, you, that means you're a saint. And this is says, no, you're a fool. Yeah. And that's good. I mean, it seems like, even though it's not awakening, but it seems like the aspect of delight is like a important magnet to the mind. Indeed, it is. So delight in those things, and as you delight in those things, you get more and more peaceful and more and more still. But here, it's the more the views and the concepts you're delighting in. It's because you, know, you take these things to be the essence of me, that's why you delight in it. So is it a pleasure from a concept? That's the problem? Indeed, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to cause, it's, it may not cause too much problem on the part of samadhi, but afterwards it's going to cause huge problems. In mm -hmm. an ordinary life, where um, a whirling, whirling yeah. um, where you catch yourself kind of like 
um, delighting in conceiving yeah. associations with objects and things. Um, how sh should one just have a kindness to that defect? Yes, have a kindness to the defect. If you're delighting things in the world, an old simile which comes to my mind, the simile of a ladder. So you start at the bottom rung of the ladder and you have to cling on and delight in the rung which is above you. And if you let go of the rungs above you, then you're never going to get anywhere up the ladder. So you hold on to the rung above you and you attach to that, you cling to that, you grasp to that, just like the simile of the raft. But then there comes a time when actually you're standing on top of that rung. And now is the time to let go as you go higher. So, you know, we, we grasp onto higher things so we can move away from them, a little lower things. But there comes a time when we have to let go of the higher things. But if you try and let go of everything, all in the same moment, you never get anywhere. You're always at the bottom of the ladder, stuck in samsara. So please, delight in generosity, delight in kindness, delight in your precepts. Later on you can let go of delighting in precepts and generosity, but delight in those things first of all. And later on when you, del you have the jhanas, delight in the jhanas, because they're higher, attached to those. But later on you come to the time when you have to let go of the jhanas as well. So the similar the ladder, you know, you always use something which is very high, to actually to grasp onto, to pull yourself up and then later on you can let go of that. You have to attach the raft to get across the street. There comes a time to let go of the raft but not in the middle of the river. Is that delighting? Is that about like more like perceiving um, like the stillness of the absence rather than delighting in the concept? I think it's delighting everything. It's delighting in the ownership, delighting in the idea, which creates the attachment and the uh, possession. The, you know, the refined delighting, like yeah. delighting in that rung above. Yes, yeah. Is that more to do with seeing in it a quality of beauty or freedom rather than an idea of ownership? It is, but you own that as well, because you can see in each one of these is the you know, the lesser things, just in being or just in the four great elements, you know, perceiving this is my, my, um, my portrait, this is you know, my possession, this is my iPod, this is my car, four great elements. So still people attach to those things. But then you get even higher, you get into you know, gods and jhanas and stuff. You can delight in anything, but the point is that it's much better to delight in the jhanas first of all, instead of delighting in your iPod. Of your life, is there this idea of possession or experience? It is, yeah. It's, you know, because of these things, because you possess it, you delight in it. Because, you know, I, I know, I'm sure I've seen these people, these incredibly fast cars like Lamborghinis and Ferraris. They really delight in them. I don't, because it's not mine. <laughs> they really delight in it. So it's important not to get too negative to the idea of delighting. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Negative is another type of delight. Delight in negativity. <laughs> <laughs> People get into that. Okay. So, having gone through the states of being, the body and the different states of being, now... Yeah? Yeah. Is that in the is that the lighting so I'm just thinking like you know in the Brahma Vihara, is that the lighting in is that a five sense? That's a six sense the light? Brahma seems to straddle sort of the Karma Loka and the first Rupa Loka. Mm -hmm. So but it's a state of like you know, you're almost leaving the world but not quite. So like if you have loving kindness, if you're doing like the loving kindness meditation and stuff? Is that, um, it has a danger. Remember that Ajahn Chah's famous saying, when the monks went over to the west, he said, be careful, have too much metta. If you have too much metta, you'll end up having babies, he said to the monks. Ajahn Chah, you have to practice metta to 
<laughs> Indeed, yes. <laughs> but uh, he was very good because sometimes that's that's a man, especially a man or some senior monks, they just are too compassionate. The poor girl, you know. There was this, there was, uh, what was his name? Uh, Santa Gita, really nice monk, but you know, there was this poor lady in a wheelchair. And you know, I think she was crippled or something. He took so much compassion on her and started sort of, you know, really looking after her and ended up marrying her. It was very nice, you know, he's a very, very good monk, very sweet, but you know, it was a bit sort of, you know, he had too much metta. In other words, a lot of metta but not, wis not enough wisdom. And the amazing thing, I must say that he was always really sickly when I knew him. I remember one, <laughs> this is a typical story, I'll always remember him by this. There was one of the monks had scrub typhus, we all got this disease, I got it once, and heavy fever like typhoid. And so he took him to the local hospital and Ajahn Santajito just took him to the hospital. So here's the guy with a heavy fever and as soon as the nurses saw the two of them coming in, they gave the wheelchair to Santajito and said, you sit down. He said, no, I'm not sick, he's sick. <laughs> but he always looked that way. But then last time I saw him, after he got married, he looks really nice and healthy and strong. It's amazing just how well he looks. <laughs> I'm being honest. Yeah. I was when you were talking about the contentment, that was in the five senses, you know, like you were talking about those people that enjoy contentment, they just want peace. But I thought that that was like a, um, you're getting enjoyment of the sixth sense, like contentment, yeah. letting go. That's right. So that's why the Buddha said the enjoyment of the sixth sense is not so much of a danger. So, so the contentment, peace, and let's say, uh, softness of the heart, is that sixth sense pleasure? Yeah, that's a, that's a sixth sense pleasure, and that's a higher realm. But, you can still have the contentment, you know, out in the world. You know, just, I would say the two sort of realms, it's just like, you know, you go and watch a sunset in the evening. You know, see this beautiful sunset, you feel so peaceful, so content. It's not exciting, the pleasures of the forest or the pleasures of nature. And that's you know, similar to sort of what I say is the pleasures of the, the Tusita realm. Not the excitement of you know, watching sort of Jimi Hendrix or you know, sort of really exciting play or movie. But, you know, just this beautiful sense of like peace, the peaceful pleasures. And just one last thing, so you can't Sensory. delight in it, because you've got to delight in it, so automatically if you delight in something there is the I am, but what about the people like the Arahat that delights? They can delight, but they don't have the I am. That's right, yes. So it's a different type of delight, yeah. Sorry? Different types of delight. So we can't avoid like... Indeed. Because even see all the Arahats after these talks, except for this one over here, mm -hmm. they say the bhikkhus delighted in the Blessed One's words. Mm -hmm. And some of them were, were Arahats. So delight is a very yeah. wide word. Okay, now let's go into the scene and the not scene. Mm. Now remember the Bahia teaching? Yeah. In the scene will just be the scene. Mm. Mm. Be careful. Mm. Mm. Because look what it says here. You perceive the scene as the scene. And in the end, mm. you delight in it because you haven't fully understood it. Mm. It's much more to in the scene than it's just the scene. Because you perceive the scene Having perceived the scene, you conceive yourself as the scene. This is who you are, the experience of now. He's looking at me. That's who you are, Judy. You are this experience of the scene. And, or you conceive yourself somehow that you are doing the scene. You conceive yourself as, as in the scene, or oh, no, actually as as uh, I've gone apart, apart from the, se the scene, it means that somehow that you are doing the seeing. Well, in this scene, in this experience of now, that's where you exist. Or you can say, this seeing is mine. I am doing the seeing. And then you delight in the seeing. Oh, how beautiful it is to see the monks. How beautiful it is to see the nuns, the bhikkhunis, the Tibetans, 
uh, Mahayanas, Theravadas, all living together. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> Why is that? Because you've not fully understood it, I say. <laughs> This is really banging people on the top of their head. Or you perceive the herd as a herd. The sense as a sense. The sense means what's smelt, tasted or, or touched. That's the sense. So those three particular of the six senses, they bung together as the sense. You perceive the sense as a sense. Having perceived the sense as a sense, you conceived yourself as this experience. And you're never so much as alive as when you're sort of touching your beautiful wife, when you're having the best sex, when you're just all tasting this delicious food. You haven't lived <laughs> until you've tasted mushy peas. <laughs> Whatever. People really get into these five-star restaurants and they just pay an enormous amount of money for this. And then they say, this is me. This is experience. This is life. Or you see that somehow that, you know, this is you know, part of you. Or you know, that somehow that, that you are in this. Or you could say, this is mine. These are my senses, my experiences. This is what makes me. And because of that, you delight in all this sensing. You just want to go and get a different meal. You just want to go and listen to some even greater music. You want to go and see the Berlin Philharmonic. They used to be the most, the best orchestra. I don't know if they still are. And if you haven't seen that yet, you're missing out. You haven't experienced this. And sometimes, you know, you get sort of enraptured by the sense that this is the essence. This is me. This is somehow or other you've touched the infinite. You delight in it. Why is that? Because you haven't fully understood it, I say. Or, oh, I just finished the cognized. Or you perceive the known as the known. What you're knowing now. How you perceive the known and known, you conceive yourself, this is me, I am the knowledge. I am the truth, the way, the light. <laughs> <laughs> I want to add to that, but you get the point. <laughs> or you conceive yourself that somehow that this, you're in the knowledge, that this knowledge, the logos, the truth, you know, what you can know, forget about the senses, your mind, that somehow you're in this mind, or this mind is somehow in you, or you are the mind, or you own the mind, that you own your knowledge, and you delight in all that knowledge, which means when you make a mistake, you will never ever admit it. Because that's like saying that you are a mistake. That it's a fault in you. Because you own it. You don't own your knowledge. I'm only 60 and I'm beginning to forget things. <laughs> Judy is older and you're already forgetting much more. <laughs> so I am not my knowledge. It's already going away. I don't know how old you are now. You're the oldest of 70. And you're already sort of losing it. <laughs> Great, lose it. <laughs> so, you're not, because sometimes we delight in that. You know there's people who delight in their knowledge, they just really up themselves, and just, you know, they can never listen, they all know too much. Because they haven't fully understood it. So they think they know, but they've not fully understood it. Now be careful there, because Baha'i is teaching. In the, her in the scene, it would just be the scene. In the herd, it would just be the herd. In a sense, just a sense. In the known, just the known. It's not as simple as that. Because what we actually perceive, as we are saying later on, we get to the, the whippalasas. By even the time you perceive it, the bare perception is already being distorted. Ask any psychologist. What you see is not what's out there. It's already been filtered. You only see what you want to see. And the parts which you don't like are filtered out. You only hear what you want to hear. You only sense what you want to sense. What you don't like sensing 
No. That's why it's called a denial. Sometimes, you know, you're making a bit... No, I didn't make that mistake, it's not me. I couldn't have made that mistake, I can't be wrong. Yes, you were. Even the known. How much of what you know is under the radar? Because it's not what you want to know. That is the problem. So even in the know, we've got to be very careful because it's been bent even before it comes to our senses. Ask any psychologist. What are some of those great, there's heaps of experiments, which are really nice to see all these experiments in psychology. And it was, uh, <laughs> oh, you know that, I hear a couple, it's the, the one with the, um, the, the door. This was done, I think this was done in was it Princeton, I think. So, this student went up to just this victim, just one of the visitors to the college, and they just asked him, which is the way to the chemistry labs? And before they could answer, two workmen, you know, they were part of the experiment, came right between the two of them, carrying a door. It's really rude. But you know, only for a minute or 30 seconds. And then afterwards they carried on the question, oh, you know, where's the chemistry lab? So, you know, just over there, turn left to the physics department and right over there you find it. But what had happened is when the door went between the two of them, the first person who asked the question went with the door and was replaced by another person. And they wanted to find out whether you actually perceived the one who asked the question. And they tried all different types of question, uh, uh, combinations. The first person who asked the question, maybe like an Afro-American male, and the next one would be this tiny sort of uh, Caucasian woman. And they, they, they turned it around and most times people didn't, didn't recognize the person who asked the question had been changed. Because all they perceived was the question. They didn't perceive the person. And it would just show that even in the sense, just how much is filtered out. Because there you have like, you may have some President Obama asking the question first of all, and afterwards, you know, sort of Analia. And they don't know, it's been changed around, they think it's the same question. So questioner, sorry. Now that's the first one. The other one which I was done in Harvard, which I really liked, they to put the students in like a movie theatre and they just flashed images on this, the screen. And I wanted to find out with a notepad when you could actually understand what the image was. And the one I remember was they flashed an image of like the steps at one of the well-known um, when well known buildings in the campus. Every student would know that. It was flashed so quickly that you, know, you couldn't actually see it. And then they increased the exposure a little bit longer, a little bit longer, and then they started writing down what they thought it was. And one person wrote down it was like a ship. And then they continued writing it down it was a ship, even though the exposure was so long that if you showed it to anybody they would see it, no, it's the steps to one of the buildings. What it was proving is once you have the idea, it's a ship. You can't see it anymore. You can't see it as steps. Because the views will bend your perception. If that's what you want to see, that's what you will see. That's why that many people who've been in marriages, when you first fall in love, your girl, your man, they're the most beautiful girl in the whole world. He's the most wonderful man in the whole world. I'm so lucky to have found him. And then, ten years later when you get divorced, why did I ever marry him? I must have been stupid. <laughs> why does that happen? No, they haven't changed. They're the same person basically. What's happened is you're seeing things in a different way. Your perceptions are being bent. When you're in love, the person is beautiful. When you're getting divorced, all you can see is their faults. Both are distortions. That's why be careful. In the seen, in the heard, in the sense, in the cognized. Don't take it on face value. Even what you're hearing now, you're filtering so much. If you're a 
got great faith in Ajahn Brahm. Wow, this is really profound. But if someone's really upset at me, that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. <laughs> you add so much. Okay, comments. So, um, you know, in the different realms of Vedanta, oh, yeah. as you're refining the pleasure, um, is it almost inevitable that for an unawakened person that there's going to be all these distortions? Yep. That's the difficulty. You have all these distortions, and because of those distortions, you're really lost. Maybe if you look at this particular sheet now, because the Ripalasa sheet on the back. This is, teaching, this is from the Anguttara Nikaya, but this is actually was explained. When Bhikkhu Bodhi explained this sutta, he brought in these Ripalasas, which means like the distortion of the cognitive process to really make a very profound explanation about what the problem is. So you've got these three, three things, the view, perception, thought. You can start anywhere on that cycle, but I like starting from view, because that's what they're starting from here. When you have a particular view, say you know, you're a born-again Christian, then that particular view will bend all your perceptions your bare perceptions, you will see the truth, you know, of Jesus and God in everything. And it's obvious, it's, it's basic, but can't you see? Just have a look at the stars at night. A being would have to have created that. But it's God, it is. It's very clear when you start off with that view. But once you have those basic perceptions, that's the building blocks of your thoughts, your concepts. You think about it, you philosophize, you theologize. And that just confirms and reinforces your view. And round and round you go. From the view, it bends your perceptions, the perceptions bends the thoughts, the thoughts make your views. And I say just, oh, what might you say? That sort of, oh, like say, communism is bad. That's your view. And when you say communism is bad, you can perceive all its faults. And if you perceive all its thoughts, you think that way. And the thoughts, that just they reinforce your views and you go round and round and round. It doesn't really matter. Communism is good. You perceive it as good. You think of it as good. You view it as good. That's why you have all these people arguing. And you know, sometimes it's, it's amazing when you actually meet people. They may be, say, Muslims. You're a Buddhist. And you see them in their sincere people. You can see they're not mad, they're not sort of intelligent, no, unintelligent people. So why can have some very different ideas than me? And just explaining it, because once you start off with a particular type of view, it reinforces itself because it bends perceptions, it bends thoughts, it bends views. And one of the examples which I use, because I like to stir people up, sex is enjoyable. Sexual intercourse is pleasurable. Who would ever, except Ajahn Brahm and other weirdos like me, who would ever question that? And I love stirring people up. Because, you know, sometimes you say, why is it? Because once people have, and it's basically the whole idea of lust in the Western world is predicated on, yeah, sex is fun, it's good. And once that is drilled into you, then the perception actually is that sex is fun. Simply because the view is started there and you actually perceive it. Fair perception, yet yeah, it's enjoyable. And because it's so enjoyable, you keep thinking about it. You fantasize. And that just reinforces your view. Yes, yeah, it's obvious, it's fun. And I like that example because you're questioning sort of a sacred cow, no, nothing religious at all, but as an idea which is an assumption that sex is fun. And actually the reason I say that is because once the Buddha told Ananda the pleasure of sex is a perversion of perception. You're not seeing as it probably is, it's actually suffering. It's like the emperor's new clothes and the kid comes and says, I can see it's actually it's not fun at all, it's actually suffering. And once you get the right view, then you perceive it. Just what, what do I want to do this for? So, you know, you don't think of it as something pleasurable. 
and the view becomes reinforced. I get I like saying that because that stirs up a lot of people. But this is Vipalasa, just how a view creates your perceptions, which manufactures your thoughts, which reinforces the view, and you go round and round and round. So let's try before we ask questions another view that Buddhism is the way to truth. Well now let's make it even more controversial. Let's start with the view that you need jhana to get enlightened. <laughs> is that true? Okay, that's my view. And then all my perceptions based on that view. Actually, yeah, it's actually true. I can honestly see that. You read the suttas, and it says, you know, that jhana is necessary for enlightenment. You read Mahamulukya Puta Sutta, it says that you can't get to enlightenment without jhanas, no more you can get to the, the uh, essence of a tree. The, well, the pith of a tree without going through the bark and upward. So, you know, you think that that's logical, and that reinforces the view that jhanas, yeah, they are um, necessary for enlightenment. Other people say, no, no, you don't need to get jhanas, you can do sukha vipassaka, just, you know, the dry insight. And people have that view, they can perceive, yeah, it's obvious, it happens. They look at the suttas, they can pick out all those sayings in the suttas which reinforce that, and they start thinking it, it reinforces their view which one is right. When you first saw that you thought, this is really sort of dangerous. You know, have I got right view or wrong view? And the answer is that what actually uh, bends your perceptions, you already made it, it's what you want to see or the denial of what is unpleasant for you. Desire and ill will. Those are what perverts the cognitive process. The five hindrances. First two, desire and ill will. If you have any desire there at all, desire for jhanas, desire for anything, that will pervert this whole mental process. It will bend it so it's not truthful. If you have any ill will, I don't want to be stupid, I don't want to be sleepy, I don't want to be restless, I don't want to have fantasies. Any ill will bends the truth. Obviously the restlessness, you're not still enough to see it long enough to get its truth. South and top of the darkness obviously it's just you in darkness. And even in doubt, again it's another type of restlessness. The five hindrances is what bends perceptions, thoughts and views. Which is why the Buddha's path was to abandon the five hindrances, overcome them, and then what you experience, perceive, even think, when the five hindrances are gone, that you can trust. Nothing else. That's why the path was samadhi, stillness, overcome the hindrances, then see the Dhamma. Everything else you can't trust. Yes. <laughs> in daily life, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, a being can assume that all their perceptions are distorted. Yeah. Should one just sort of have the attitude which soften the five hindrances? That's attitude should be just let's get rid of the five hindrances. Samadhi, jhana. Mm. And then five hindrances are gone, then you can see something. But you know, like in ordinary functioning state, yeah. you know, where there's activity and perception. Yeah. And, um, is it like practicing the um, kindness and awareness? Is that, is that part of the remedy the, there? Part of the remedy because it leads to samadhi. Mm -hmm. But remember, asking questions, that will never get any answers. When you go to ask a question, the five hindrances are still there, it's still deluded. So everything which you ask and the answers you hear, that's not truth, that's just part of the cycle of delusion. <laughs> I thought I was going to stop the questions. <laughs> it didn't work, it's a good try. <laughs> Go. It doesn't clarify it, that's a problem. Questions don't clarify anything. They'll just make more questions. <laughs>
But if you have the view that questions clarify things, then you perceive, yes they do, and then you think they do, and you'll ask more questions. <laughs> Okay, go for it. If you want to perceive it that way, fine. Yep, but this, if you go back to this little sheet over here, you see that the wrong view is basically that you, or the wrong perception or thought. You say, say on the realm of perception, you perceive what is impermanent, subject to cessation, as permanent, stable. You perceive what is unstable, so you see what is stable as impermanent. You get it the wrong way around. The next ones are my favourites. You perceive what is suffering to be happiness, like sex, like eating, like being, like asking questions. <laughs> That's, That's right. In, in like a wholesome thing, like to get that into samadhi. So, so, using, so how to use the light without getting trapped in all this? So, so this yeah. Gradually. The wise ones, they uh, perceive what is happiness is happiness. What is suffering is suffering. And this happiness is the happiness which is born of letting go which is born of things disappearing, which is the ending of things rather than the starting of things, which is the freed freeing rather than the entangling. So it's that type of happiness. That's the happiness which the Aries delight in. They see what is happy is happy. That's why many times that people, you know, you, sometimes people come here for their holidays they have like a week off and they go to monastery, they go back to work. So when you go to your holidays, did you go to Bali, did you go to China, did you go to Cable Beach Resort? No. I went to a retreat where I sat meditation only at one meal a day, slept on the floor. <laughs> you did that in your holiday? Yeah, you had to pay for it too. <laughs> wow! You could do that in a prison. <laughs> because they see what is happiness as being suffering. Well, how many people come up to me and say, it's been a month for 37 years, that must be really tough. You know, just what you had to endure and you know, giving up all of these things, that must be very difficult. It's so tough being a person. It's not tough. It's tough being a lay person. I don't know how you endure it, just with a wife and kids and money and stuff like that. That must be terrible. Having to go to movies and keep watching the next episode of the soap opera finding out what's happening in the soccer and always being sort of, you know, caught up in that sort of stuff. It must be crazy to want to do that sort of stuff. So that's what the, they say the enlightened people say is, is suffering. The world says is happiness. What the world says is happiness. is suffering, the enlightened ones say is happiness. It's the happiness born of letting go. Yeah. Justify his view that, that the Buddha didn't teach reincarnation. Okay, he has that view. And once you start off with that view, if you can put yourself in his head, okay, and just there's no reincarnation, then the perception, you can actually look through the suttas and say, look, it's the Buddha told it's in the present moment. How can you ever know there is reincarnation? Where's the evidence? 
No, I haven't died yet. I can't remember my past life. And if I do remember my past life, how do I know that's not a fantasy? And just some sort of dream? Because sometimes people, they get crazy. Even yesterday. Do you remember where you were yesterday? Are you sure that was actually true? Or is that just a, a dream? So, you know, what was that? It wasn't Socrates. Was it? Um, am I, you know, in the simile of the cave? where he saw the shadow in a cave, you know, am I the shadow or am I the thing which is making the shadow? Which one am I? How can you trust your senses? He was asking. So, if you really have a view, any view, mm. you can perceive and he's a logical person. He truly believes what he says. And convinces so many people. Yeah. Well, that's the problem because other people, they want to believe what he says. Mm. That's the difficulty of being a teacher. Because mm. if you teach people what's really true, well they don't want that. Well, like the best example was Rajneesh. He was just so clever because you know, he had the view that one of the best ways to get enlightened was have as much sex and indulgence as you possibly can because you know, eventually you get tired of it. So okay, well, go for it, get it out of the system. And that was very, very smart because it's such an easy path to market. <laughs> okay, you no, know, if you feel like having sex, have it. You want drugs, have it. Come on. Sort of, you know, just be honest to yourself and honest to your feelings. And just do it quickly enough, indulging it, and then after a while it will be gone. You know, you see the stupidity of it. Watch as many movies as you can, after a while you get bored. Now that's a very nice teacher. Oh well, you know, because well, you know, I like having sex. I like watching movies. I like eating whatever I want, and you know, I'm getting light at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll sign up to that one. <laughs> and people get caught up into that. So once you have a particular type of view and you want to believe, and you want to sort of um, perceive, then you can perceive. So it's, it's dangerous, but it's really a teaching. The Buddha's a incredibly psychologist. So even all that you sense, so all you see, hear, sense and cognize, you can't trust it. Even bare perception, you cannot trust. Because the defilements, especially of desire and ill will, greed and hatred, have already been at work before it comes to your consciousness. except when the five hindrances are gone. So, now you go into even more interesting stuff. You perceive unity as unity. So here you're getting into more metaphysical concepts. Uh, the oneness. You perceive oneness. And once you perceive oneness as oneness, you conceive yourself this is me, this is us, we're all one, this is life, you know, we're just emanations of oneness, that's what life is, just the one, it can only be the one, how else can it be anything other than the one, truth has to be one. So you conceive yourself, you know, you are part of the one, or somehow, you know, that you are contained or you contain this essence, this oneness. Or you conceive that you know that you own the oneness, that this is this is your possession, your attainment. You've attained the one. And because of that you delight <laughs> in the oneness. And because you haven't fully understood the oneness. This is the concept. Or you perceive in diversity. We're all different. That life is so diverse. You have to have diversity. You cannot have the night without the day. You can't have the suffering without the happiness. You cannot have the fish without the chips. <laughs> you need the diversity. <laughs> so you perceive diversity as diversity, you conceive yourself that this you are you're not one. You're all different. This this sea, this ever evolving sea of diversity. That's life. It's obvious, it's not one thing. So just have a look outside, it's 
Life is diverse, that's its essence, that's its meaning. So you can see for yourself as your part, the great diversity of life, the seething sea of life. Or you can see that somehow this is, you're contained in this, or that this is part of your expression. You can see that this is mine and my attainment. And because you delight in it, that's very stupid. You haven't fully understood it. Or instead of diversity, one is diversity, very simply the all. At last you've come to the all. It cannot be anything bigger than the all, which contains absolutely everything. And you at last you perceive the everything containing the just anything which can ever be perceived or known or understood. You've got it. That's me. That's the essence. Not an Ajahn Brahm or Matt or Annie. It's everything. That is the real me. I'm part of you. You're part of me. We're part of the everything. And you can see this is your essence. Everything. Or you can see for yourself, yeah, this is the big and, and me is actually part of this. Or somehow you can see this is the idea of itself is bigger than anything and it contains the all. Everything is contained inside of this, which is me. And because of that, you think you own. It's your possession, your attainment. And then you delight in it. Why is that? Because you haven't fully understood it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, okay. That's getting down. It's okay I'm getting into the oh, the yeah. unity. Go back to that stupid ladder again. <laughs> okay, let's go down to earth. Uh, yeah. Are, are these are these sort of pleasures that people as they grow in wisdom grow onto? Now remember this is just like the Brahmajala Sutra, these are all about views. Ideas. That's why with this Vipalas it's especially looking at the view part. The different views which people will have, mm -hmm. the essence, who they are, where they belong. And obviously that people weren't stupid in the time of the Buddha. Sometimes people have this idea that now we're far more educated and refined. And in those days that people were primitive. And maybe just okay the Greeks had some philosophy but we've taken it much further since then. I think it was uh, Aristotle would say, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants so we can see further. And what they're saying over here, no, that you know, in those days they saw as far as we do. And they still had these great cosmic ideas of the all, the everything, the ground of all being. The, what's the other sort of ideas people have? Cosmic consciousness. And here, the, you know, if they had the ground of all being, if they had that here, that would be in this one as number 27. Or, all these concepts of the ultimate reality. So you might say he perceives the ultimate reality is the ultimate reality. And perceive the ultimate reality is the ultimate reality. He conceives himself as the ultimate reality. You conceive himself in ultimate reality. You conceive yourself somehow the ultimate reality is contained within your essence. Or your, you are inside of it. You conceive that ultimate reality is my attainment. I've at last reached and possessed ultimate reality. And then you delight in ultimate reality. Why is that? Because you have not fully understood it. <laughs> okay, go on. These, these, these don't really sound like Buddhist views. No, they're everything views. I mean, it sounds like Hindu civilization. It's all sorts of views. It's Hindu, it's, it's Kabbalah, it's I mean, Sufi, it's, you, know, you see this all over the Western world in sort of New Age stuff. It's, it's been there since time immemorial. So on the ladder that is sometimes taught, is that more to do with pleasure and refinement that comes from the simplification? The ladder is more concerned with the practice of how you get you know, out of these views. So this is actually, this is where we're starting from. This is where people at the bottom of the ladder, they perceive ultimate reality is ultimate reality. They're still at the bottom of the ladder. They've still got the five hindrances. They're part of this or different sort of uh, swirls of uh, perverted perceptions. And how do you get out of that? 
you have to get up this ladder. So delighting in some things, delighting with what is letting go, delighting in sort of peace, in freedom, non-control, is a way of overcoming the five hindrances. But when you get high enough, the five hindrances are gone. You're high enough at the top of the ladder, you can see over the wall. And you see all these things, I understand. This has nothing to do with me. I'm none of these. Uh, Danny had a hand up first. <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah. But then I just remember that everything is dukkha, so isn't that... Mm-hmm. I'm still dukkha because it's conditioned and all that, so how do I understand the bliss of letting go? Because you're letting go, but it's conditioned, it's dukkha, but it's sukha. It is because... There's no sukha, isn't it? Like, when you take sukha out, it's just anta, dukkha, anta, because there's a sukha there. Yeah, no, that's part of the, the whipalasis. This is what... This, sukha, sukha? Yeah. This is what the Buddha said. He said, the difference between unenlightened beings and Aryas. So the Aryas see what is Sukha is Sukha, what is Dukha is Dukha. So is there Sukha? Because everything is Dukha. Is it? <laughs> like, uh, like the bliss of letting go. Are you enjoying that? yourself right now? Huh? So, <laughs> there is such a thing as Sukha. Yes, well, as soon as you let go of something, yes. that is sukha. The ending of suffering is the arising of sukha. And is that less conditioned? Of course it's conditioned. But everything is conditioned. Exactly. But it's still sukha. But it's sukha, but it's not dukkha? But no. like ultimate, reality, you know, ultimate reality, this is the problem. <laughs> no, that, like, that disappears, it's even better, right? It's better, yes. Yeah. So, 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 so let's say, it, when it disappears, it's even better. That's so right. that's really, not really sukha. It's so like the sukha is like the marketing campaign to get you out of the five hindrances. Right. So it's like, you know, the free gift, it's the carrot. It's the yeah. thing which, which gets you going. Okay. Until you get enough sukha, then you can actually see what really is sukha, what really is dukkha, and how they all roll around each other. So it's like our, our sukha meditation. That's right. That's right. One of the other great sayings of the Buddha is that the more you let go of the five senses, the more you experience sukha. If you want to experience full sukha, fully let go of the five senses. It's a great little saying, that's in the Jatakas. It's a great saying about jhanas. Yes, yes. Because they're not delight. They don't dare to delight. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't delight if they want to. But anyway, the last one, number 26. They perceive Nibbana as Nibbana. Wow! They've actually got Nibbana now. <coughs> they perceived it, not Nibbana as... Uh, they're not perceiving not Nibbana as Nibbana, they're perceiving Nibbana as Nibbana. And perceive Nibbana as Nibbana. You conceive yourself as Nibbana. This is me. I am Nibbana. You conceive yourself contained somehow in Nibbana. Or Nibbana is sometimes contained within you. Or Nibbana is mine. I have achieved Nibbana. I am an Arahat. And you delight in that. I'm an hour hurt, you're not. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's an ordinary person, okay? <laughs> so in other I'm words... not ordinary anymore. Well, no, because they haven't... Why is it? Because they haven't fully understood it. <laughs> I say. Okay, so in other words, this is that, just like ultimate reality, sometimes people think, yeah, this is Nibbana. Not fully understood it. And you know it's not fully understood it because you can see that's you. This is your ultimate reality, this is your essence. You think this is me in Nibbana. But wouldn't non-self have occurred before in Nibbana? It has to. Oh. But if you have non-self occurred, then there's no idea that this is me or mine or I'm inside of this or outside of it. And there's no way of like, calling this an attainment. Mm. An attainment is something which somebody attains. 
Well, there's no somebody, where's the attainment? So I like to say, like, sometimes people think of these jhanas or streaming, once returning, non return arahats as little medals. But you can't put a medal on sort of empty space. There's nothing to pin it to. It just falls to the ground. So like, like a, a real enlightened being claiming an attainment is like trying to pin a medal on empty space. You can't do it, it just falls apart. If you can pin a medal there, it means it's not an area. It's not an enlightened being. The stomach's still there to hold the attainment. So, now that's the ordinary being. Now, once you're a stream winner, this is one who's in higher training. They call it, actually not higher training, this is a bit sort of um, uh, an exaggeration to make it feel easily for people. This is called one in training. They call it Seika, a learner. This is where, as I mentioned many years ago, this is when you get your L plates. Until you're a stream winner, I'm sorry to say, you haven't even got your L plates yet. <laughs> that's really, well, my God, that's really tough. <laughs> that, that's really true. You're still messing around. Depressing. It is depressing. <laughs> you're still you know, doing well, you're getting somewhere. <laughs> but this is, now you're in training. In other words, you've seen the go, you, you know, you've got to understand what's going, you know what enlightenment is. Whose mind has not yet reached the goal, and who is still aspiring to the supreme security from bondage, direct... Okay, this is, you know, you know that you're not enlightened, you've got some stuff to do, and now I'll start to let go of, and you're letting it go. So, they directly know the four elements, earth, and all these, these other... Um, things, the earth, fire, earth and water, you directly know the beings, the devas, Pajapati, Brahma, the jhana realms, the arupa realms, you know the sense, the, the seen, heard, sense, cognized, uh, known, know the, sorry, the unity, diversity, the all, Nibbana, you directly know these things. In other words, you've had the experience of uh, first stream winning, so you, the view is straight. No way that you can ever really understand these things as real, permanent, part of me or whatever. So having directly known these things, and directly know is what no, Ajahn Bhamaya has been really trying hard to. This is the Kayapati Sangwedi. This is direct personal experience. Not theory anymore. You've had these experiences of insight which blow you apart. You've known something. So once you've had that, now you must train yourself. You've got the right view in this thing over here. The right view is perfect. But still the perceptions which you have, the way you perceive, is sometimes based on the new right view and sometimes based on past bad habits. A good example of that is Ananda. He was a disciple, the attendant of the Buddha for 25 years. And when the Buddha was dying, he said, no, he's going to go pretty soon. Ananda was a stream winner. He'd heard all these teachings about, you know, this is just five candors, there's no Buddha there, not of yourself. So he knew, but he was so emotionally distressed that his great teacher was going to die. He went you know, to a, a door frame, he leaned against the door and started crying. And he said at the time afterwards, he said, the Dharma completely left me. I didn't understand the directions, I was lost. So his old habits had overcome his new wisdom. He had these perceptions of a stupid uh, attached being. So this is what sometimes happens to a stream winner. They can still have lust, they can still have ill will, they can still have grief, they can still sort of express these old things. And later they come to this, why do I think that's stupid? Basically you forgot. And the old habits of many, many lifetimes, overpower the new wisdom. Which is what the training is. You know, a lot of the training is on mindfulness that remembers, and keeps in mind what the Dharma is. So the person then, they have to train themselves. 
having directly known these things, you should not conceive yourself as these things, or conceive yourself contained in these things, or conce conceive these things contained in you. You should not conceive these things to be part of you, to be mine. You should not delight in these things. Why is that? Because that way you may fully understand it. Fully understand it means continually. In other words, not a moment of cognitive experience when you don't you know, think that you know, this experience is my essence, this is me. Or that somehow that, you know, this is contained in you, or you're contained in it. But this belongs to you. Basically, none of it is my business nothing to do with me. And that way when the Buddha dies, well, it's not my Buddha. Buddhas come, Buddhas go, and each other like everything else. Husbands, wives, kids, parents, dogs, they come, they go. Well, what are you grieving about? Nothing to do with me. They're not mine, not my possession. Yeah, you come to monastery, then you have to leave. Yes, why well, grieve? It's just part of life. You come and go. That's a part of life. So you don't grieve, you don't feel sad. You don't feel that, you know, that you're somehow inside of these things or these things are inside of you. They're not yours. This is a training to always remember. This is why I keep on saying, remember that this is not me, not mine. Nothing to do with me, none of my business. And even your meditations, they're not yours. You don't own your attainments or your peace or whatever you've got in this retreat. If you carry all your attainments back home with you, you'll suffer enormously. Leave them in the past. They're not yours. They don't belong to you. And that way, that's your training. That's you said you should not conceive these things. You should not delight in them. Why is that? Because that way you'll fully be free of them. Continually. So even all these things, in the sense, so the seen, the heard, the sense, cognized, all these things, you just know exactly what they are. They're not yours, you're not inside of them. So, you know, you see something you don't like, you see something you really like, or you cognize something in your meditation, a great experience. You don't think that that experience is yours, or somehow this is the essence of who you are, that I'm the Arahat, or that I'm the sort of the jhana achiever. You don't do that. That's your training, you have to keep on doing that, training yourself, because it's so easy to you know, forget and really sort of indulge in the sense of ownership and keeping and clinging to those things. Why? So you can fully understand it. And even Nibbāna, you directly know Nibbāna, have directly known Nibbāna, you should not conceive yourself as Nibbāna, that you've attained Nibbāna. You not conceive that somehow that you know, you're in Nibbāna or that Nibbāna's in you. You should not conceive conceive that Nibbāna is yours. I've now got Nibbāna. You should not delight in it. Why is that? Because it must be fully understood. That is the job of the person in training. Now, we have Arahat 1, 2 and 3. And 4, sorry. But it's not much different. Monks, a monk who is an arahat, who with taints destroyed, the outflowings destroyed, who has lived a holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and is completely liberated through final knowledge. Again, lots of synonyms, but they're worthwhile looking at. An arahat literally means one who is worthy. Asked who has outflowings destroyed, who's lived a holy life, done what had to be done. So that's your job, finished, complete. Lay down the burden, reach your goal, destroy the fetters of beings, completely liberated through final knowledge. Does such a p person still suffer? Do they experience suffering and other How come? I mean, they've they finished. They've done the job. They've destroyed suffering. How c do they suffer? Or are they blissed out all the time? You, you, you guys have always heard my talks too many times. That's, that's one question I sometimes ask people. Do arahats suffer, or are they at peace forever after? So no, they still suffer. The, the mental arrow has been taken out, the physical arrow is still there. So, and that's why they say, the arahats, this is the arahats talking about themselves. 
they say they're like the workman waiting for their wages. They've done the work, they haven't got the cheque yet. It hasn't been paid into their account. So where do they get the wages? That's the Parinibbana, at the end of their five canvas. That's a payoff. Which is one of the reasons why, when I visited the four holy sites, we've done it many times, sometimes people always thought that the most important site was Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha became enlightened, under the Bodhi tree. I said, no, the most important site was Kusinara, where the Buddha received his wages. <laughs> Different way of looking at it. So anyway, that's the Arahat. He too, or she too, or it too, directly knows the four elements and all these other things, but he does not conceive himself or herself or itself as this, or contained in it, or these things somehow embracing him. He does not conceive these things to be his or hers, mine. You don't delight in these things. Why is that? Because they've fully understood it, I say. So never any moment do you think that these belong to you, that they contain you, or that you're someone apart from these things who knows these things. That's why sometimes when people say that the real self is, is apart from the five candors. That's my real self. Yeah, the five candors aren't mine. Yeah, we know that, but my real self contains these five candles, bigger than them, this is how the, it expresses itself. That is again just totally rejected by these statements. You don't conceive anything of these to be yours, because you fully understood it. Arahat too, again, a monk who is a nun, lay person Arahat, completely liberated with fine knowledge, they directly know these things as they are, they do not conceive these things as, though, as anything. And why is that? He does not delight in earth. Why is that? Because he is free through lust or desire, the destruction of lust. And Arahat three does not delight in these things, not because they have fully understood it, because they have fully destructed, destroyed ill will. And Arahat four because they have completely d destroyed delusion. So that's why in the little table over here, the, uh, the reason and again, the four reasons there, you see the Arahat under the, uh, the line, the reason, the, the column reason. Because they're fully understood X, because they're devoid of lust, devoid of hate, devoid of delusion. So that's just the reason why all of these uh, ideas, there yeah, they perceive it, they directly know it just as a stream winner, but they do not... Uh, ever have the idea, the thought, the conception, this is them, they're part of this, or this is part of the, them, or that they're mine. So they don't delight in these things because of these four reasons. And lastly, the Buddha, the Tathagata, they never call him the Buddha, they call Tathagata, the thus gone. Because the Tathagata too, accomplished and fully enlightened, directly knows the four elements as the four elements. Having directly known the four elements as the four elements, he doesn't conceive himself as the four elements, doesn't conceive himself as in these four elements, doesn't conceive himself as uh, being a part, owning these four elements, does not conceive these four elements to be mine. He does not delight in the four elements. Why is that? Because it's understood that delight is the root of suffering and that, what, and that with being as a condition there is birth and that for, oh sorry, I've gone too far. Uh, why is that? Because the Tathagata has fully understood it to the end, I say. So that's the, the deeper experience of a Buddha. Different from the, uh, the Arahat. The Arahat has uh, understood it enough, sufficient to become enlightened, but the Tathagata has got incredibly broad knowledge. And Tathagata too, the bhikkhu, the Tathagata, to accomplish and fully enlightened, directly knows the four elements as the four elements, the states of being, the jhana realms as the jhana realms, as the, uh, the, the seen, heard, sensed, cognized, and the uh, unity, diversity, the all and nibbana. Directly knows these things, exactly what they are, never conceives himself as these things, 
does not conceive himself as part of these things or conceive himself contained in these things or containing these things, doesn't conceive himself to own anything, even these attainments, doesn't delight in these things. Why is that? Because he's understood that delight is the root of suffering and that with being as a condition there is birth and if whoever has come to, to being there is aging and death. Therefore monks through the complete destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up and relinquishing of cravings the tiger is awakened to supreme full enlightenment, I say. So this is where it comes into part of dependent origination, a new part of it. The light is the root of suffering with being as a condition there is birth and through birth is aging and death. So by cutting off the lights, by relinquishing cravings, you stop all being. Remember what I said a few days ago that existence is what you create with craving. <coughs> So this is where it says in here, because he has understood dependent origination. But this is only just that part of dependent origination, not the full part. Just that delight, craving creates being. Being, being is a cause of birth, and birth creates this aging and death and suffering. And the Tathagata, because he's understood all of these things, given up a relinquished craving, the Tathagata was awakened to supreme full enlightenment, I say. So that's the last piece of the reason there, that's the Buddha. So on this appendix here, this table there, which actually puts the whole of this uh, sutta into a nice table form for people easy to understand. You see the unrestricted worlding, the learner, the stream winner, once returner, non-returner, the arahat and the Buddha, the primary cognition, they perceive something, the stream winner, they just perceive it as it is, they don't directly know it, they don't see it in its real essence, they don't know it as it truly is. The stream winner, once returner, non-returner, arahat, the Buddha, they directly know what it is. And the uninstructed worldling, they just think this is me, that they're containing it, that they contain it, or that they own it. The stream winner, sometimes they do, sometimes they're not, they've got to train themselves not to do those things. The Arahat and the Buddha, they never conceive these things as themselves, they never think of these things as uh, being in them, or they contain these things, or they own these things. And in that, the Arahat and the Buddha are exactly the same. And the result of that is the uninstructed worldling delights in these, these things. The, uh, the, the, the world in terms of the four elements, or the different states of being, or the seen, heard, sensed and cognized, they delight in those things. But the learner, they train themselves not to delight in these things, never to conceive these things as uh, themselves. But the Arahat and the Buddha, they never delight in these things anyway. And the reason is because the uh, uninstructed worlding, they haven't fully understood what's going on. The learner, they partially understood, but they need to make it full understanding and the Arahat, they fully understood it, they're devoid of lust, hate, delusion, and the Buddha has fully understood it to the end, and understood dependent origination, that's the difference. Go on. Did the Arians, when they directly know, did they have a direct um, seeing of phenomenality in something? Yeah, this is what's called insight, the direct knowledge of the, of the Arians, that at least once in their life, completely seen the truth, now they know that there's no self there. They know that what real suffering is. They know they've seen it very deeply. Therefore their view is straightened. But it just takes a time of training to make sure that that view is full. And for that it's more like continual, rather than just moments where you lose it. Where, where, where in this chart it's got under initial response, it's got directly knows? Directly knows means You'd actually probably best say it's directly known. After reflection or something? Yeah, so the initial, well sorry. Uh, well the initial response, it's not really an initial response. They perceive something, they're directly known. The truth. So if I just change the word there to directly known. Directly I, I know you can call it res initial response, it's like a response they've had well, at least once, they're directly known what the truth is. Oh, the past tense? Yeah. Is that for all of the Aryan categories? Yeah, 
except for the arahat, because they don't directly know that that knowledge is there all the time. That means in that the view is perfectly straight, so the perception and thought are always straight too. Oh yes, Dania? Ah, yeah. How do, how the, the thing is, like so that? to practice the right in things, that you can't do it. Mm. You'll find no matter how much you try and restrain yourself and renounce, mm. you'll find the cupcake is delicious. <laughs> the cup of chocolate, I delight in this. You can't do it. Mm. And the reason is, there's another sutra in the Anguttara, where it says that you cannot overcome greed and ill will until you've become a streamer in the first. You've got to see non-self, otherwise you will always have desire in your will. Overcoming desire in your will, delighting in things, is, and in the things of the five senses, is your table of the anagami. You become a stream winner first, then you lessen the delights uh, as a sakadagami is a once return, and you fully overcome the delights in the five sense world as an anagami. But you, that's one of the a lovely things to know. So you're not so bad if you delight in sensory objects. It's just because that's uh, you have to become a stream winner first of all. You have to see it on self. That's why those initial rungs. We don't really mind sort of monks delighting in things or nuns or people delighting in things. That would be a fun. The whole point is just to have enough, but not too much, so you can actually get some deep meditation, get some real delight, overcome the five senses, see the Dharma, become a stream winner, and then it's done, then it will, it will happen by itself. That's why there's another sutta where it said, the difference between Sariputta and Moggallana, Sariputta would tra train his, his students to become stream winners. And once they were stream winners, okay, you, you know, it's in the Dharma now, now, now you can start learning. And uh, Moggallana would train them up to being Araha. But he said both were very good, because once you get to being a stream winner, that's Good enough, it's going to happen now. Go on, quick. Because here it says, <laughs> 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 the, the, the cause, like when we saw the Arahat, he delights, and then the had because he, like, has, uh, he, no, he doesn't delight because he's devoid of lust, hate, and wounds, so all that is the cause of delighting, right? Yeah, the and cause of delighting is thinking that you own these things, and it's delighting. part of you, yeah. Like the root, we saw the root, right? It's yeah, it was a, well, it's especially the delight which causes rebirth. That's the second noble truth. Yayang dan ha ponobarika. This craving which creates rebirth, ponobarika. Nandi raga sahagata, which is with um, delights and lust. Tatra tatra binandini. Delighting ever here and there. Yeah, sure. They're, they're similar things. But even the way that we use the words, even delight in English, it's, it's loosely used. So it's not precise. This is not like a theology or an Abhidharma. The Buddha would use the words as people would use the words. And we use those words loosely. I delight in that teaching. It's a wonderful teaching. It doesn't mean you're lusting after it. Okay, yes. Um, uh, when the Arhat attains Nibbana, the will is gone. Is that when the will is gone? Ah, no, the will will always be there until the time they're having Nibbana. But they know the will is not there, so it's nothing to do with me. Oh, so that's our something, then what causes them to act? Yeah, because it's worth it. Yeah, it's coming all from compassion, from kindness. But that's what I thought earlier, intention to do. That's what, yeah. But they know that's not theirs. I see. That's just cause and effect. And the physical body the karma has its physical body. That's right, yeah. Back pain. Back pains, yeah. yes. Headaches. So there will be physical suffering. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the mental arrow has been taken out. Mm. Yeah. You mean that to the end for the Buddha, is that there is no more rebirth? Or? Oh, no, for the, all the arahats no more rebirth. Mm -hmm. Buddha's no. To the end means actually just the, uh, the deep understanding, the fuller understanding. 
So just like, what's a good experience? Like, maybe because, you know, I've lived in this monastery for 37 years, I know more ends of this monastery than you know. Because I've been here longer and seen it deeper. But it's just the more broad, the broadest knowledge. No one can know that knowledge broader than the Buddha. Um, you had a question, I think, was it? Brendan? Okay. Okay, now, what happens next? The last sentence. That is what the Blessed One said, but those because did not delight in the Blessed One's words. <laughs> and it was not because they were trying not to do any delights. It was because they didn't understand a word of it. And interestingly, because it's, it's ironic, irony is the right word, because of whippalasas, views, perceptions and thoughts, when this was uh, not just translated but transcribed in the Pali text, so even the, the Pali of the Pali Text Society's edition was transcribed by Miss I. B. Horner. And when she came across in Pali, but those speakers did not delight in the Blessed One's words, her view was that the monks will always delight in what the Blessed One said. That was their view. So the perception was that that must be wrong, that must be an error. So she trains, changed the Pali into the monks delighted. Even though all her other manuscripts told they did not. So in the Pali Text Society version it says the monks delighted in the Blessed One's words. And it was a good example of how the Whippalasa works. <laughs> the monks have to delight, so this must be an error. And that's a very good example of when you read suttas. You say, this can't be right. <laughs> so you think it must be wrong and think, oh, the Buddha must have made a mistake, or this must have come, you know, I've been added, you know, by monks later on. Be careful, because sometimes what you see in there, if it doesn't agree with you, it doesn't mean it's wrong. But be careful because the way that we perceive, we don't agree with it, I must be wrong. This kind of Buddha couldn't have said that. No way. And we change the truth according to what we want to believe. That's what the Wipalatas are all about. And it's a great example because you see that that happened with a you know, very good professor, a very wonderful sort of uh, uh, person. And interesting, if you don't know about I.B. Horner, but, you know, she was the president of the Pi Tech Society, so she was translating all these books, and so as a young Buddhist, you know, you'd read her works and her books, and then uh, up in uh, Thailand, in Wat Nana Chat, this young man came, and his name was Jeremy Horner. And he was an interesting guy, because he just finished his degree uh, in London University in psychology, and he had a friend of a friend who was taking racehorses to Singapore to race. And apparently, you know, you put them on an aircraft, but you need about three or four attendants of the horse, you know, by law. And you know, the horse doesn't need that. By law, you have to have a couple. So they said, look, we can give you a free air ticket to Singapore. You know, he's supposed to be, not what they call the stewards or the, what are they called? Not stewards or whatever. But the people look after the horse. Yeah, that's a special word for him anyway. So he got the free ticket to Singapore, just because he knew somebody. And, you know, finished his degree, just see Asia and work his way back to, to England and then get a job. And then, uh, he went to Bangkok and he met some, um, some doctors who were working in the refugee camp, you know, looking after the refugees after the Vietnam War. And they said, oh, you know, why didn't you come up and see our refugee camp? So he went to see the refugee camp in Ubon. And, you know, he had no idea of Buddhism at all, nothing to do with Buddhism. But they said, well, the only other Westerners, you know, in Kui are the monks. So he came to see the monks. And, you know, no idea of Buddhism at all, no sort of faith at all. But that first day, he said, I want to stay overnight. He stayed overnight, and the following morning, he appeared in front of the abbot with his head shaved. Shaved himself and said, look, I want to be a monk. And that's Sajan Amaro, who's now taken over um, Amawati. That's Sajan Amaro's story. 
And of course, when I heard that, I said, oh, this must be a special guy. Are you any relation to this Ivy Horner? He said, no, I've never heard of her. And I thought, oh, that's a bit of a shame. But then, you know, he remembered that. He went back, to, I think his father had a heart attack. So he went back and he wrote to me afterwards. He said, I just asked my father, just, are we any relation to I.B. Horner, the professor at Cambridge? And uh, his father said, that's your aunt, that's my sister. He said, but she's, I never, I was, was so embarrassed about her, she's a real weirdo, and all sorts of strange stuff, that, you know, we didn't want you to associate with her. And there, and there he was. This guy, has got the same genes as this party professor, and eventually became a monk and a really good monk. So it's really strange how karma works. It's a really, very, very interesting story. And apparently by the time he found out, yes, that was his auntie, which he'd never seen in his whole life, or well, maybe when he was a baby, that he managed to see her just before she died. Because, you know, she was very old and very sick by that time. And so, you know, it must have been very good for her to know that, yeah, you know, she'd done all this work on translation and she had a member of her family became a Buddhist monk. Very nice story. But anyway, the monks did not delight in the Blessed One's words, but later on, they did. Because, since the Gautamaka Sutta, oh, I've lost it now, where's it gone? Uh, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. Because later on, the Buddha gave them another. So there's always a happy ending. Five. Uh-oh. Oh. What does it go to Maka? What does it say? Uh, have you got your notes there? Okay. Right. I'll tell you what. I thought I had it, yeah. Hey, let's go to Maka Street, sir. Oh, I lost it. I'm throwing myself too much. Three, one, two, three. Three, one, two, three, okay. Here we go. At the Gotamaka Shrine. Thank you very much. Now this is apparently the same monks who later on, they must have been obviously thinking of this and contemplating it because the happy ending is it's a very short sutta here. On one occasion the Blessed One was stay dwelling at the Gotamaka Shrine near Waisali. There the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, and these are the same monks, on the basis of direct knowledge Remember this direct knowledge, seeing things as they truly are, that's what the direct knowledge means here. That experience of seeing the truth. On the basis of direct knowledge I teach the Dharma, O monks, not without direct knowledge. On good grounds I teach the Dharma, not without good grounds. Convincingly I teach the Dharma, not unconvincingly. Therefore, monks, my advice should be followed and my instructions accepted. This monks is sufficient for your satisfaction, sufficient for your gladness, sufficient for your joy. Full enlightenment is the blessed, blessed one. Well proclaimed is the blessed one's dharma. Well conducted is the sangha. That's uh, itipi so bhagwa arahang samasam buddho suwakato bhagwata dhamma supatipano bhagwato sawaka sangha. Thus spoke the blessed one. Gladdened, those monks approved of the blessed one's words. And while this discourse was being spoken, the thousandfold world system shook. So now they understood. So that was the happy thing. So the whole point of that sutta, which I hopefully you've got, is just what the real problem is, what delusion is. That's why I don't like the word ignorance, but delusion. And the vipalasa is the process of delusion, it's mechanics. How delusion works and how insidious it is, and how hard it is to break. Why it sort of keeps people in samsara for lifetimes. Because once you have a view, that will create your perceptions. Bend perceptions to fit your view. And your perceptions will be the building blocks of your thoughts. And your thoughts will just reinforce and justify your views. And go round and round and round, from lifetime to lifetime. Always thinking you're right. And it's so hard to break. And you can never break that through argument. You can never break that through listening to Dhamma. The only way that's broken is by stopping the five hindrances. No more wanting to see anything. No more scared of seeing truth. But being really fully open. No desire, no ill will. 
no fear, no excitement, being fully open to see things as they truly are, through the stillness which overcomes the hindrances. The way to enlightenment, the Buddha said, is not so much the jhanas. The jhanas are part of it. The way to enlightenment is the jhanas because they overcome the five hindrances. So you can see things as they truly are. And so this whole uh, perversion, distortion of your knowing is broken. And that's why when you do get the real insights, I've never seen this before. My goodness, how come I never saw this earlier? You understand why I never saw this earlier? You couldn't see it earlier. Because the uh, five hindrances, desire and aversion, were just bending. And you really trusted your perceptions. You trusted your thoughts. And you believed in your views. Be careful. What you think it is, is not the truth. So that's why this was the first sutta. This was a big one, huge mammoth. And that's why even disciples of the Buddha, born in that time, they became monks with all those great parameters, didn't understand it. If you do understand the sutta, then you'll be getting somewhere. Do you understand it? Are you sure? <laughs> or is that just being bent? There's no one to understand it. Is that true? Is that your view? Are you sure that's I could <laughs> Did I say it or is that just your perception? <laughs> bent. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, go with last question in the back. Uh, an idea that can be a bit elucidative. The road, like imagining a dragon spitting fire and flying and everything. I think everybody here can imagine it. But a dragon like that doesn't even exist. But I could create everybody reality. You can create your reality, creating other people's reality is people very can difficult. Imagine that? Yeah, people can imagine it, yeah. But this is actually why, why we want to perceive these things, or why are we afraid of perceiving some things. Now that is the more interesting part. Thank you. So, who's going to do the handamaya now? Now let's express our approval of this Dhamma teaching. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Anumodami. Very good. We didn't understand, but we do approve. Do you delight in what's been said? Sanghang Namami <laughs>